Thanks for listening to The Rebuild, a Seattle Seahawks podcast with me, Rob Staten. I didn't want the Seahawks to trade a third round pick for Matt Ryan. He's 37 years old and they're not going to win a Super Bowl this year. It had cost you a club control player for four years at a great price in a draft that is loaded in the middle rounds. So what was the point? If Ryan wins you two or three extra games next season, in the long term, it probably just hurts you. I saw him live in London against the Jets last season, and he looks like an old 37. And how much longer is he genuinely going to play on for? I never really got the sense that Matt Ryan was going to be one of these players that goes on to age 42 or 43. This might be the last couple of years of his career, and a stopgap, expensive veteran just doesn't really fit the Seahawks right now in a way that it fits the Colts. And frankly, they don't even have the money to make a move like this. Neither currently do they have the money to afford Baker Mayfield, and we'll come on to him in a bit. The Seahawks only have about 10 to $15 million to play with currently, with still a lot to get done. But this in part is a problem right now in Seattle. By insisting publicly that they aren't rebuilding, as Pete Carroll has done, and by throwing quite a lot of money at players like Quandre Diggs and Will Disley, you give the impression of activity and ambition even if some of the names that they've spent on are not quite that exciting. Fan expectations do change, especially when you give an impassioned press conference speech where you insist over and over again that you want to build a contender. When you are asked point blank whether Drew Locke can lead you to a championship, which was a question that I'm sure the reporter had to conceal a chuckle as he was asking, Carroll insisted if he plays the way that he did in his rookie year, then yes, that was possible. So like I say, fan expectations change. And I think that's part of the reason why some people are suddenly clamouring for a Matt Ryan or a Baker Mayfield on Twitter. Maybe they can be good. They're better than Geno Smith. Maybe the Seahawks don't have to go through a lot of pain to come back out the other end. The reality is that they are. This Seahawks roster is not good. And when that reality hits in September and October, if you've told people over and over again that you have no intention of rebuilding, you've simply set yourself up for a fall because that is exactly what is happening. Here's what the Seahawks have done this offseason, the cold, hard facts of what they have done. They have removed their franchise quarterback, acquired a lot of stock for the future, and replaced Russell Wilson with Drew Locke. They've swapped Carlos Dunlap for Yuchenna and Wosu. They've swapped DJ Reed for Artie Burns. They've cut Bobby Wagner, and they've added Quinton Jefferson. They've retained Al Woods. They've swapped Ethan Posick for Austin Blythe. They've swapped Gerald Everett for Noah Fant, and Shelby Harris has come in. That's it. They've done nothing to improve generally across the roster. There's no one impact addition that is added to what they've already had. In fact, they've subtracted quite a lot, especially at quarterback. They've done nothing to improve the offensive tackle spot. Are they really improved in the trenches at all? Not really, unless you see Shelby Harris as a major upgrade addition, or whether you see Chenna Uwosu as somebody who is going to reach new heights in his career and surpass the impact that Carlos Dunlap had at the end of last season and during the 2020 season. They've pumped resources again into non-premium positions like safety and tight end. If we're just going to be honest, as we sit here today, right now this team looks like a candidate to gain the number one overall pick next year, which to me isn't such a bad thing because I'm embracing a long-term rebuild. I think it's necessary. I think the Silks will be better for it. But is Pete Carroll embracing this situation? If they were to go with Stone Forsyth at left tackle and Jake Curhan at right tackle just to see what they've got there, I'd be perfectly happy with that, provided they don't force an offensive tackle pick in the draft. My fear is that what is actually happening here is Pete Carroll builds his rosters year to year. When they get to the draft, he perhaps sits down and says, what do we need? And they go and get it in the draft. 
when I think the better way to draft is to think who's the best player, who is going to have the most impact, not because we need a certain position to be filled for the upcoming season, but which player is going to have the best impact for us between the next five to eight years, for example. And I don't think the Seahawks have thought that way for some time now, perhaps not since those early years when Carol and Schneider came in and they were building something for the long term from a ground zero rebuild. When Carol came in in 2010, he would have seen it as a ground zero rebuild. I think the problem is now is that the same thing is required, but he has too much attachment to players like Quandre Diggs, like Will Disley, that he's brought these players back because he thinks that they are part of a championship core when really what was probably needed was a complete clean slate after Russell Wilson's departure. And the tackle position is particularly troubling for me because I think this draft is set up to go and get a game change with your top pick and possibly with picks 40 and 41 as well. I think they should be setting out to select a game changer for the defensive line, such as Kayvon Thibodeau or Jermaine Johnson at number nine. And if neither of those players are available, they should pivot to someone like Devontae Wyatt, who can be that rare, quick, strong interior pass rusher in the Geno Atkins mold that this team has needed since day one of the Carroll era. Alternatively, you go and take a chance on someone like Derek Stingley, who, yeah, people are down on him at the moment because of injuries and not being at the combine and the way that he played the last couple of seasons. People forget that LSU completely imploded after winning the national championship, where Stingley looked like the next best thing since Patrick Peterson. I still think Stingley's got a lot to his game. All of those players, those, those four defensive players have got potential for greatness, in my opinion. And you could probably include Jordan Davis in that as well. I'm afraid to say that if they go into this draft saying, we do not have a left tackle, we need to get a left tackle, and then select, for example, Charles Cross or Trevor Penning at number nine, that will be a huge mistake. Because while the Thibodeaux and the Johnsons and the Wyatts and the Stingleys and the Davises all have that potential for greatness, Cross and Penning do not. Their ceiling for me is as an average starter. I think Penning's ceiling is probably going to be in the Eric Fisher mold. A decent player, perhaps not a liability, but certainly not a building block to a championship team in the way that I think some of the other defensive players could be. And I think Cross is just overrated. This is a man who had a 26-inch vertical. He's athletic in terms of running in a straight line at a 40, but his agility testing was nowhere near, for example, someone like Abraham Lucas. So what are you actually getting? His knee bend's not good. Yes, he can kick slide very well and mirror. That's certainly going to help you in the uh, pass protection stakes. But I don't see a player that five years from now will be talking about as one of the best left tackles in the league. I think Thibodeau and Johnson and Wyatt and Stingley and Davis have got the potential to reach those levels. So I'm, I'm a little bit fearful right now that as the Seahawks don't make moves at offensive tackle, it's pushing them towards a certain decision in round one. And this is why I wanted them to sign Trent Brown. Not because I thought an, a slightly injury-prone Trent Brown or 300 and whatever, 80 pounds of him, was going to give the Seahawks a fantastic chance to win now or in the future. It was simply because it decreased the chances of them reaching on an offensive tackle in round one. And I thought if they sound the two Browns, Dwayne Brown and Trent Brown, then they would set themselves up in the draft not to reach for anybody. Apart from perhaps quarterback, because that's not been addressed. So I am a little bit worried that the Seahawks are going to overthink this one, or perhaps not think enough, about what is best for the long-term future of this team and try to complete a roster. My fear is that Carroll will think signing Unwosu to pair alongside Daryl Taylor is enough. That's that need addressed. Signing Shelby Harris as an interior rusher means that needs addressed. Signing Artie Burns to play corner means that needs addressed. What haven't we done? Left tackle. Let's go and get whichever one's there at nine. You can't draft that way. And I sincerely hope the Seahawks won't. I am content targeting instead, for example, Abraham Lucas later on. 
I love Lucas as a player. I think he's got terrific potential. I don't understand why he's not being talked about in the first round enough or as much as I would expect. And if he's there at, let's say, 40 or 41, I would definitely be interested in taking him to play right tackle. That would be a good pick. They might like Tyler Smith with the way that he plays. They might like Walker at Penn State. But those types of picks for me have to come after you've set, taken your game changes in the front seven. That is how you're going to build the foundation of this team. That is what the target should be from this offseason. Because you can't rebuild a complete roster in one offseason. The target should be to come out of this draft with a devastating pass rush and front seven that contains speed, physicality, pressurizes opponents, is good against the run. Get that right and produce a running game and you will be well on your way to producing a contender. And then next year, with cap space and more picks and the potential to go and get a young quarterback, you can put this team in a position to win. But you have to accept what this season is about and you have to understand that reaching in this draft will be a bad idea. So I hope, fingers crossed, they will sign some tackles soon with that 10 to 15 million that they have left. I want to talk a little bit about the fallout of the Falcons, Matt Ryan, Indianapolis Colts trade as well today, because it certainly impacts Baker Mayfield. Suddenly the Colts are no longer an option. He is the team that his representatives or even he himself have gone public with as saying he's got interest in playing for. They're no longer an option. Moments after Matt Ryan went off the board, the Saints, who were never going to trade for Ryan in the division, re-signed Jameis Winston. The Falcons, who suddenly had a need, maybe one or two people were wondering if Mayfield ended up there. They went out and signed Marcus Mariota. So all of a sudden, Mayfield's options practically non-existent. And this is what I was talking about a few days ago. There was a lot of buzz on Twitter about Mayfield, get Mayfield for a second, get Mayfield for a third. And Browns fans saying stuff like that, you can understand. Every team wants their, every set of fan base is one of their teams to, to go and make fantastic trades and get more picks and, and all of that. But it was strange to see Seahawks fans saying, chuck the third in or conditional third or a second to get Mayfield. That was nonsensical. It was never going to happen because the Browns had no leverage. And today, they've got even less. They have to get rid of Baker Mayfield. They went to ESPN, and someone, unprofessionally, told Chris Mortensen that they need an adult at quarterback. There is no way after saying that, that Mayfield's going to come back into the quarterback room and play the game that the Cleveland Browns want him to play. So there's no going back from that. He has to go after he said that, and they should let him go as well. Furthermore, they can't afford to pay Deshaun Watson, whatever it is, guaranteed $250 million. And I think they've brought Jacoby Brissett, in, isn't it, to, to be his backup at a, at a decent price, like $4 million or something like that. Can't then have Baker Mayfield just sort of sitting in the stands watching the game or sitting at home on his couch earning $18 million. It's impossible. The Browns have two choices today. Either they cut him and eat the $18 million or they facilitate a trade where they end up paying most of the $18 million and give him away to get him out of the building. That's their choice. If the Seahawks want Mayfield, they've played a blinder. They've let the market come to them. They've waited for other teams to address their needs. They've reduced any kind of competition for Mayfield. Now the Browns are looking at the Seahawks as well, maybe even a last chance along with potentially the Panthers, I suppose. But why would the Panthers want to pay Mayfield 18 million and Sam Darnold 18 million? Yeah, they're just going to collect draft busts who are stuck on their fifth-year guarantees. I don't think they're going to do that. So if the Seahawks want Mayfield, and I believe they do, I, I don't think they're, they're desperate for him or anything like that, but I think they see him as somebody they would be interested in bringing in his competition. I think they will view him as the... 2022 version of Marshawn Lynch, somebody who's fallen foul at his old team, who's clearly got talent, and they can bring him in and try and work some magic there, see if they can turn him into a star. I think that's how they will view it. 
So I think they'll be interested in him, but at the right price. And now they're in a position where the right price is coming to them. I suspect, whether he goes to Seattle or somewhere else, that the only thing we're seeing now are the Browns struggling to come to terms with that. They're like a child, which is funny to make that comparison, given what they said about Baker Mayfield, struggling to come to terms with reality, having a tantrum, maybe you could say. And then in time, they'll probably realise that their parents were correct and that they're going to have to just let him go, let Mayfield go. It may even cost them a, a late round pick. It may cost them $10 million to facilitate a trade. But they have to let him go. They have to move on. And they don't want this in the headlines for the next few days, surely, especially not weeks. They need to get this sorted now. So the question is, when will the Browns come to that realisation? Today? Tomorrow? Next week? Right before the draft? Who knows? The clock is ticking for them. And I wouldn't be surprised if Baker Mayfield came to Seattle to join Drew Locke in second chance saloon, as Carol seems to want to know this as, to try and win a job and a future with the Seahawks. It was interesting as well today that ESPN's Brady Henderson wrote an article which included the following quote. Indications have been that the Seahawks don't like any of the prospects in this year's draft enough to take in the first round though a middle or late round pick could be in play. My initial reaction to this was very positive. I don't think that, for example, Jack Cohen at Notre Dame or Caleb Ellaby at Western Michigan are that much worse than some of the quarterbacks who are being talked about for the first couple of rounds. And given a preference of rebuilding your defense early and then taking Jack Cohen as a shot to nothing, that would, that would definitely be by preference rather than taking Malik Willis or Matt Corral or whoever in the first round. But then I remembered that for the last 12 months, the Seahawks have been telling the local media that they weren't going to trade Russell Wilson. And why would they tell ESPN that they have minimal interest in the top quarterbacks at the top of this draft? It may be true, it may not, but we're in that kind of season now. You know, teams don't generally just reveal their plans to the media to allow them to report. So I'm, I'm going to take this with a pinch of salt and choose maybe to be a little bit optimistic that they feel this way because I don't want them to take a quarterback early. But I think generally, and I've, my conversation with Scott McClure, and please check it out if you haven't already, kind of suggests what the truth is behind this quarterback class. That while the media is desperate to pin Malik Willis into the top 10, whether that's with Seattle, I'm sure in the mock drafts that will come up in the next few days, we'll see Willis placed number six to Carolina or number eight to Atlanta. And maybe the Seahawks will then get left with Kenny Pickett or Matt Corral or whoever at number nine. The media is quite keen to force these players into the top 10. And who knows, maybe it will happen. Maybe Carolina will take a chance on a Willis or maybe the Falcons will take a chance on somebody like that. I think what's more likely is that these guys are just going to last to 18, 20, could the Lions move up? Could the Falcons move back into the first round? Could the Seahawks move back into the first round to take one of them? Maybe. But I don't see them going in the top 10. And that's what McCl McLuhan said, that these guys are going are to go in the first round, three of them, but they're all rated as third-round picks. One final point on the quarterback class. If you haven't seen it, Chris Sims on Pro Football Talks, NBC, YouTube channel has been giving his quarterback rankings on his podcast today. It's always interesting because whatever you think of Sims, he's been pretty good at, over the years of predicting which quarterbacks can be really good. And he's thought outside the box and been proven correct on a number of times. Now, last year he wasn't so correct, I guess, because he said that Zach Wilson was the best quarterback out of Trevor Lawrence. And then I think he had Matt Jones at number three. I think there's, the jury's out on a lot of quarterbacks last year. He wasn't as high on Trey Lance and Justin Fields, and I completely agreed with him on that. And I don't think that either showed anything to, to, to suggest he was wrong. I just don't think that Zach Wilson was shown, as shown in year one to be as good as maybe Sims projected. And, you know, the only one of the rookie quarterbacks who actually did anything last year was Matt Jones, who had at number three. But when he put Matt Corral at number one in his list, I took note of that. 
because he, he, he generally knows what he's talking about in the quarterbacks. He's shown that. He's got a track record. It's worth listening to him. And he said that Corral was the only one of the quarterback class who warranted a place in the top 10. And he spoke very highly about his release, his arm strength, his athleticism, his technique, throws he was making for Ole Miss. It's just something to remember. If for no other reason than that little cosy picture of Pete Carroll and Monte Kiffin and Lane Kiffin with Matt Corral having a meet and greet to the combine. At the same time, the reports are coming out that the Seahawks are interested in Matt Corral. Lane Kiffin and Carroll are close. They've drafted a, a Kiffin quarterback in the past in Alex Magoo. And again, referring back to the McLuhan conversation, he spoke very highly about Matt Corral as well and thought he's going to go in the 20 to 32 range. I might not think the Seahawks are going to take a quarterback early this year. Brady Henderson's sources may not think that. I wouldn't rule out the Seahawks moving back into the late first to select someone like Corral and to keep taking shots at quarterbacks until they find the next one. That might be their approach. Schneider somewhat hinted at that they've not been good enough taking quarterbacks over the years. Who knows? They might take Matt Corral early and Jack Cohen later or Caleb Ellaby later. It might be that as the Seahawks move forward now, they're going to keep drafting and keep drafting and keep drafting quarterbacks until they find one. And let's not forget, where does Schneider come from? He comes from Green Bay, where they selected Aaron Rodgers when they had Brett Favre, and then they selected Brian Brougham in round two. A first round pick, and a second round pick, very close together, trying to find a long-term future beyond Brett Favre. If the Packers are willing to do that and keep taking shots to find their guys, there's nothing to suggest the Seahawks won't take Matt Corral at the end of the first or in the second round this year, have a good look at him, and then be fully prepared in a year's time to take another quarterback early. That is what the Packers did. It might be what the Seahawks do as well this year. For more conversations like this, plus special guests and analysis on everything Seahawks during this crucial offseason, subscribe to the Rebuild podcast, now available on Apple, Spotify, and YouTube. Until next time, bye for now.